If you've ever wondered what it's like to meet a bikey, well, there's few who've lived that life quite like Jeff Snake Eyes Campbell. Thankfully, when we meet, he comes in peace. Hello. Hey. Nice to meet you. <laughs> what, what, is, that, is, that, is that a special bike uh, or shape? It's just a good mate shape, yeah. <laughs> right, OK. That's I haven't it. been inducted or anything like no, that. No, 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 you're right. <laughs> All right, take you're a right. seat. Snake Eyes is old school. The old school was riding your bike, rain, hail or shine, sleeping in quarries, sleeping in paddocks, wherever, and um, enjoying your brotherhood with your mates and your Harleys. You know, like you wake up in the morning, your beard's all white, and you ride and you got to wipe the ice off your glasses. The bikey culture of today is almost unrecognisable to someone like Snake Eyes. Just like the baseball bats and chains, the old school rules and codes have all but disappeared. Well, the, just the drive-bys and stuff like that, you know, that didn't happen in our day. And we, we never went to houses where there was women and kids, never shot at any houses, never went to the person's work. If we wanted to get somebody, it was either in a pub or on the street. Just like the rest of Australia, bikey gangs and gang culture have transformed entirely in recent decades. They're now diverse and multicultural. And that's meant their codes of brotherhood and loyalty have changed too. There certainly has been a cultural shift amongst the groups. Uh, before, they used to be very tight, very hierarchical. Uh, and very much regulated and there was significant loyalty between members in their own group. Uh, a lot of that loyalty seems to have broken down and we're seeing far more movement between members within groups. What's interesting at the moment, I think, is how we're seeing um, whole chapters at times moving from one club to another. Uh, that's a sign that things aren't as solid uh, as they used to be. Police say patching over is what's prompting much of the current wave of violence. As gangs recruit to grow bigger and stronger, they poach members from other clubs. In Snake's day, that sort of thing would warrant retribution. They're going to say, well, f you, you know, like, you f***ing partied with us, you drank with us, you know, you shared women with us and blah, 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 and you go and join these f***ing dickheads over here, well, it's not on. What would you do to a former member that had, had patched over if you could track them down? Oh, he'd probably just get hiding, I suppose. Yeah, wouldn't be, you know, like, wouldn't be deaf or nothing, but, yeah, you'd get a good hiding and put in hospital. What would that involve? Legs, arms, I suppose, you know, jaw, and, yeah. All broken? Yeah, drop him out St Vincent's and say, see you later, mate. Mm. Police say there are 39 bikey gangs in Australia with about 4,000 fully patched members. The biggest is the Rebels, and while it varies from state to state, those fighting for membership, power and territory also include the Comancheros, the Bandidos, the Hells Angels and the Nomads. Police estimate there are thousands of associates and would-be's. The weird thing about bikies today is that many of them don't even ride bikes. You've only got to look at some of them, they're well-groomed, they wear Armani suits, they drive around in Ferraris and, and BMWs. Mick Kennedy spent years as a cop chasing bikies. If you had a tattoo and you were a female, you were considered to be either a slut or a prostitute or a bikie's mom. These days, if you haven't got a tattoo, you're not fashionable. Um, the, the whole world has changed in this whole area. Tattoos, of Harley Davidson motorbikes, of designer drugs, that whole area has changed. The way people do things has changed. The past decade has seen the rise of the new boys on the block. What is a Nike bikey? That's the one that's got the uh, true religion jeans, the flash of sand shoes, the gold around the neck, the designer t-shirts uh, with all the flash tattoos. Um, they, you know, they're, they're, they're moved ahead with culture, they're trendy. Or think they are. George Basher is making films about the gangster life, but he spent his younger days mixing in the wrong circles about, you know, belonging and power and uh, easy money, probably, sometimes. Easy money? What do you mean? Well, mate, getting involved in, in, in crooked stuff, you know, you make your money, you don't have to work. I think a lot of kids love having the power. I mean, you know, they think that if you have the power, people will look up to you. The reality of it is, they don't look up to you, they fear you. 
Explain to me why people don't give evidence, why they don't talk to police. Safety, I mean, if I was to see you, let's say I seen you and you came and you sprayed at this car. I see you. You see me. See you. And I go talk to the police, what's gonna happen to me? What's gonna happen to my family? Well, the police will look after you, won't they? How then can police ever find the culprits? Do the police know? Do the police know? I mean, come on. Police know who the f bad motherfuckers are. They know who they are. I'm satisfied we're well and truly on top of the outlaw motorcycle gangs, and that's why we've focused so hard on the particular groups involved. Ahead, what happens when the bikies ride into the cross and the deadly games played by outlaw gangs? You mean I'm gonna kiss me? Make sure they would do that. The police keep telling me that some bikies are big time criminals. The ones I've met tell me they're nothing of the sort. So I've decided it's time to meet some people who felt the full impact of outlaw activity firsthand. Richter Stoop was a bodybuilder from a good family. He was nine years older than his sister Yvette. He would always make a point before he would leave um, the house, he would always make a point to come and give me a big hug and a kiss. Um, which sounds kind of old, you know, it's your brother or whatever, but he would always make a point to give me a hug and kiss. He used to call me Biddy, and he'd be like, bye, Biddy, and he'd come up and give me a hug and a kiss, and he'd make sure that he would do that. In the late 1990s, Rick got involved with the bikies. Not long after, he was killed at the Black Market Cafe. Flowers in bandito colours placed outside the club for the victims. 33-year-old Sasha Malenkovic of Fairfield, another high-ranked member, named only as Rick Raymond de Stoop, is thought the pair had travelled to the club from King's Cross. While they were in the black market's basement, the killer burst in and opened fire. When I actually found out that he was dead, I had this, and I'll never forget it, I had this feeling come over me and I felt like my insides had just been torn from, from me and were just sprawling across the across the ground like it was just this weird sensation. Guys get involved in these sorts of things because of the glamour. They think it's, you know, it's glamorous. At the end of the day, you know, it's it's real and if you're gonna get involved with that sort of stuff, you really you've got to stop and think about your family because if it's not, you know, yourself that might end up in the grave, maybe it might be one of them. The triple murder in the basement of the Black Market Cafe was gruesome and brutal, but it was a double murder on the other side of the country a few years later that showed us just how callous and calculating the bikies could be. Don Hancock was a retired West Australian detective. A controversial identity, he'd risen to be head of the Perth CIB. He was killed along with his friend Lou Lewis. They were blown up when a bomb planted in their car was detonated, terrorist style, by remote control. He was such a lovely family man, gentle. And they murdered him for no reason. They said that he was just collateral damage. Um, it was so callous and cruel. And um, that's the morality of these people. They, they have no morality, they have no they don't care about the lives they destroy or the young people they destroy with their drugs. Back in 2000, Don was running a pub and kicked a group of bikies out for swearing. Later that night, one of them was shot dead. Rightly or wrongly, the bikies blamed Don. My kids I'll never be the same because of what happened. So anyway, I've just sort of tried to carry on as best I can just for them, and my children and grandchildren. And I have a great grandson now too. Don loved his grandchildren. And he would have loved this little fellow. Yeah. Anyway. 
We've seen the impact on families. Next, the bikey convoy rolls into King's Cross. Why are you not taking them off the streets? What are they doing wrong? This is Silverwater Jail, home to dozens of bikey prisoners. Who are you keeping here? Predominantly here we have the 84 outlaw motorcycle gang members. They belong to different, seven different groups, predominantly being combat heroes and rebels. The truth is, if you're going to be in a bikey gang, this is potentially where you'll end up. Exactly, this is the end game. We're, we're passing a lot of laws to increase powers for the police so we can get on top of this problem, which is spreading like a cancer, and it's got to be cut out. So, back to our journey. Tonight's been an interesting experience. We've gotten closer to the bikies than we ever imagined. But we also found the cops are much closer than we ever imagined. We have our own entourage with the police. They just follow us everywhere we go in. On this cold May night, the different gangs unite to reclaim their territory, to show solidarity, they are brothers in arms. So they're all saying that we can't come to the cross. In colours too, you know, it's, it's just rubbish. Uh, so tell me, Zach, did the PR stunt work? PR stunt? Yeah, it's going good so far. We're all happy. Have they given you any hassles? No. We've been cooperating with the police. The police have been cooperating with us. They stayed on their word. They don't leave us alone, let us ride in. And we did, we're here, we're in the cross now, and obviously no one's got arrested yet. So the thing I don't really understand, the police have been telling us all week that the bikies are organised crime, uh, that they're really bad people and that they need to be taken off the streets. Just wondering if you can explain to me, I've been being told by the police all week that the bikies are terrible people, that they need to be arrested. They're here now. Why are they not left, why are they left alone? Why are you not taking them off the streets? What are they doing wrong? I mean, what are they doing wrong? Doing nothing wrong? The outlaw motorcycle gangs have made a very big point of trying to create a public image as the people that like to ride around and deliver teddy bears to hospitals and that type of thing. I think it's got to a stage now where the community won't any longer fall for that. They've seen many series of violence committed by outlaw motorcycle gang members. We're here, we're doing our thing. We just proven to the public that we're allowed in the cross and we've got no problem. I guess that's the issue, isn't it? When you're all here together in your uniforms, that's what police say is intimidating for other people. That's what it is, that's what we want to show the people that we are, we are, we're not like that, we don't want to intimidate people. Yeah. We want them to feel comfortable with us, come up to us like the girls did, you just seen, no? That's what we want from everybody. Bikey wars affect us all. They happen on our streets, in our towns and our cities. But what will happen next? Will these almost daily skirmishes erupt into an all-out war? And will Australia wake up to another Milpera massacre?